Oh, good afternoon, everybody. I hope you can hear me okay. Sometimes my computer audio isn't the best. I also have a dog with me today, so hopefully she doesn't bark in the background if somebody comes to the door. But um, if she does, I'll try to quiet her down quickly. Uh, so I appreciate the opportunity to be here this afternoon and kind of share a little bit with you about what I know about black bears. Um, I've been fortunate to start my career working with black bears when I was a student at the University of Maine and was able to continue that on through graduate school and then come home to my home state here in Maine um, in the late 1990s and then in the early 2000s. Um, was offered the, offered the position as a state bear biologist, which I've held ever since. And so it's really something that was really integral to me starting my career. And so black bears are a species that is very near and dear to me. Um, and so I'm glad I had the opportunity to share what I know with you today. So for those of you that maybe aren't that familiar with our agency, I work for the state of Maine, the Maine Department of Inland Fisheries and Wildlife, and we're a state agency that is mandated to protect and manage Maine's fish and wildlife and their habitats, as well as promote Maine's outdoor heritages and safely connect people with nature through responsible recreation, sport, and science. And to meet this mandate, we have just over 125 game wardens in the state and more than 80 biologists um, working to protect our natural resources here in the state. My role as the state black bear biologist is to oversee our state bear management program. And that includes monitoring the bear population, which I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about today, as well as managing harvest and conflicts. So to get started, I thought I would provide you with a little bit of background about black bears. They're one of eight bear species found uh, worldwide and one of three found in North America. Uh, this map here is the range of bears in North America. The area in brown depicts where you find bears um, primarily. Um, and as you can see, they're very prevalent in most of Canada, um, as well as portions of Mexico and in the Eastern US. Um, as you move west, um, black bears are kind of less, their populations are more disjunct. And so in the plains um, states, Midwest states, and even portions of the Southwest, they're not very common. But then you get into the Rockies, the Cascades, um, and area of, this, of the country, you see more black bears. Then if you come back to the Southeast, when you compare the eastern bear populations, the south in the southeast bear populations are just much more disjunct. Their habitat is uh, much more occurs in much more pat more patchy areas. In Maine, black bears are found um, primarily in northern Maine's commercial forest, which is depicted in this lighter blue area on the map. And our bear population is doing really well. They're very common. I think some people aren't even aware of the status of bears in the state of Maine, um, but we have a large bear population. And as you move out of the uh, commercial forest land that is um, less developed and into more human populated areas of the state, we have lower bear densities, which is depicted in this map here in the gray area. So Maine has black bears. They're always nearly black in color. Occasionally we'll see a cinnamon bear, uh, but typically our bears are black in color with a brown nuzzle, muzzle. Um, and they also sometimes have a, a chest blaze or white mark on their chest. About 25% of Maine's bears have some kind of white marking on their chest. Uh, black bears also have a dense, coarse fur and a woolly undercoat. That woolly undercoat is really uh, important because it insulates them from the cold temperatures as well as wet weather. And bears are plantigrade. What that means is they walk on the flat of their foot and it gives them a clumsy appearance, but bears are really capable of short bursts of speed and have been clocked at nearly 35 miles per hour. You can see in this picture here, um, bears have short curved claws that makes it, it very useful for them to dig in soil to extract insects from decaying wood and to also climb trees. So black bears are very um, 
good at climbing trees. And so if you're ever trying to get away from a bear, climbing a tree might not be the best course of action. Uh, males are typically larger than females, um, with adult males ranging, averaging about 300 pounds a mane. And, but they can sometimes exceed 500. Conversely, adult female black bears really reach 300 pounds in Maine. They're typically under 200 pounds. Um, and male bears are just over three feet in length and six feet at the shoulder. So from the so, tip, I'm sorry, three feet tall at the shoulder and six feet in length from the tip of the tail uh, to, to the tip of the nose where females are just under three feet at the shoulder and five feet in length. Bears have a well-developed sense of smell and hearing, um, as you can tell by having a large nose and muzzle. Um, and, but their eyesight is relatively good, particularly at close distances, but poor or longer distance. So often when people see a bear standing on its hind legs, they think of this as an act of aggression um, but it really isn't. This is a bear trying to um, get a better view of distant objects. So if you were to encounter a bear, like if you're out in a blueberry patch, um, uh, trying to collect blueberries, uh, and you see a bear and it gets up on its hind legs, if you want to let it know that you're a person and, and to be aware that you're there, you can wave your arms in the air so that it can get a better idea of what you are and they're normally going to turn around and, and go the other way. It's often very easy to determine that there are bears in an area. So if you're out there in a favorite berry patch or just hiking, uh, look for their sign. And so this slide here shows some obvious um, sign that a bear was there recently. And so you can see bear tracks here left in the sand on a dirt road. Uh, and then uh, their claw marks as they go up a soft bark tree. This is a beech tree. And so they'll, they'll climb the beech tree looking for beech nuts and they leave a very distinct pattern on the side of the trees. And then you can also find their scat often in the roads in the springtime when they're out along road edges foraging on fresh emerging grasses or berries that are growing up in those disturbed areas along the road. Uh, and so here's an example of what a bear scat looks like. It resembles kind of a cow patty. And if you look closely in this image, you can see the seeds from the berries that it had been foraging on. Black bears are very long lived um, and capable of living up to 30 years of age. Every year when we have bears harvested here in the state, because they're a hunted species, we have a few bears uh, in their late 20s show up in our harvest. Um, and I have had, I think, bears approaching 30 years of age in our harvest. Once bears reach adulthood, their mortality is very low since they have few natural predators and they don't often succumb to disease. So that bear numbers here are largely controlled by human sources of mortality, primarily through regulated uh, hunting and trapping. Black bears have tremendous reproductive potential and a very interesting life history. Um, it really ensures that most of their cubs survive to independence. And so I'm gonna talk a little bit about that over the next few slides. Black bears um, typically can reach reproductive maturity at three years of age. So, so breed at as early as two and produce their first cubs at three. Here in Maine, um, most of our bears produce their first litter of cubs between four and six years of age. And body condition often determines when a bear can produce a litter. In central Maine, so around like the Bangor area, for example, our bears often produce uh, litters earlier than bears in northern Maine. And that's due to a um, longer growing season in southern and central portions of the state compared to northern Maine. Um, and you'll, we'll talk a lot more about that as we go about, along. Although bears uh, can give birth to between one to four cubs in a litter, most bears produce two to three cubs. So that first um, litter that a female produces is gonna be small, particularly if she's a younger bear. So if a bear is four years of age and produces a litter of cubs, she's likely gonna give birth to maybe one or two cubs the same occurs as they're reaching old age or senescence. As they get older, their litter size also diminishes. 
uh, black bear cubs remain with their mother for their first 18 months of life. So as a result, black bears only produce litters every other year. Um, and since a bear can produce a litter into their 20s, female bears are capable of giving birth to 10 or more litters and adding 20 or more bears to the population in their lifetime, which is pretty impressive. This slide I think is kind of interesting to talk about the reproductive strategy of bears, which I think is really interesting and speaks to just their adaptability to living in harsh environments. So black bears will breed in June and July, um, but they don't actually um, start embryo, embryonic development until later. And so the, what happens is a fertilized egg doesn't implant on the uterine wall until the fall. And so bears actually have a very short gestation period, about two months in length. And what happens is um, if that female isn't fit enough, doesn't have the fat reserves to produce her, her cubs that winter in the den, she'll actually reabsorb that egg and not and forego production of cubs. Um, so those females that are reproductively fit, that, that fertilized egg is gonna implant on the, on the uterine wall and develop into an embryo in the fall. And two months later in January, she's gonna give birth to cubs. Those cubs only weigh about an ounce um, and their eyes are closed. Uh, they have very small ears and they're almost hairless. They have very um, light coating of fur. And they're gonna complete the rest of their development in the winter den. So they're in the den from January until March. And when the bears emerge in the spring, those cubs, are their eyes are open, their ears are fully developed, their sight is fully developed, and they have a big furry coat. Uh, so they look very different than they did just a few months earlier when they were born. Uh, those cubs are going to stay with their mother throughout the summer, learning to forage and, and um, avoid predation and other um, hazards in their environment. And then they're going to stay with their mother through the fall. And the fall is a really important time where they're putting on a lot of fat reserves to make it through their winter denning period. And then those cubs, just before their first birthday, are going to enter the den with their mother and um, stay with her until they emerge the next spring. And I see, Zoe, it looks like you have your hand raised. You have a quick question? Zoe? Do people ever, like, sh like get fur from get the fur. bears? So you can harvest black bears in Maine and most of the U.S. where they occur. And one of the things that we like to promote is wise use when you harvest an animal and use a lot of those products. And so eat the meat and uh, use the fur products. Um, and even people use some of the fat reserves that are on bears to make candles and other products like um, wax for boots and stuff like that. Something I think that's also really interesting to people about bears is learning a little more about their denning and their denning chronology. And it also helps you understand when would bears be out on the landscape and when you wanna be kind of concerned about maybe seeing a bear or having attractants in your backyard. So black bears are gonna enter their den sometime between October and December in Maine. Um, and it's really tied to natural foods. So when there's a lot of natural foods out on the landscape, um, bears are going to stay out foraging longer, trying to build up those fat reserves for the winter. When there's not a lot of natural foods on the landscape, like nuts or berry crops, they're going to enter the den earlier because it takes so much more energy to make it um, through the fall looking for those really limited food resources. So they're gonna kind of conserve all that energy and enter the den early. So typically in Maine, um, bears on average are in the den by November 1st. But when uh, food is really poor, they might enter as early as October 1st, and when uh, food is really abundant as late as December 1st. As I stated earlier, bears typically remain in their den throughout the winter, and then as spring emerges, the bears also emerge from their den. This year is looking like a really early spring, so I'm guessing we're going to see a lot of our bears out by late March, early April this year. Uh, 
bear's den in a variety of den structures. And I'm gonna speak about that a little bit in the next few slides. And when bears emerge from their dens, females with cubs are generally the last to leave their dens. Um, and it's because those cubs are still small and that female with those cubs are gonna remain close to their, their den site. So here's an example of a female with cubs in a winter den on the, on the left here. And after they emerge from their den in the spring, they're, they're basically out there searching for food because they're, they've lived off their fat reserves and they need to kind of replenish. And as those cubs come out, like I mentioned earlier, those are the ones that are gonna stay closer to that den site. But as each day passes, those cubs are gonna get stronger and they're gonna to start to be, become more mobile and start foraging further from that den site. And so you're less likely to see cubs at this age out on, on the landscape, but later in the summer, you might encounter them as they move more. This is a time of year when bears first emerge from their den, when cubs are most vulnerable to predation because they're very small. Uh, and about 25 to 30% of our cubs actually don't make it to the second year of life. Um, and that is, but most of our mortality actually occurs before they leave the den. And it's often related to how reproductively fit the female is. So I'm just gonna talk a little bit about den structures. One common misconception is that bears den and rock cavities are caves. Uh, very rarely do we actually see rock cavities in Maine with bears in them. Uh, if you go to Western Maine where it's a lot more rocky, that's maybe more of a common den type. But in general, um, bears in Maine um, den most commonly in brush piles, which you can see here in the top right. Um, and so Randy Cross, who was our bear biologist for a number of years, he's at the entrance of the den there um, under tip up mounds, you know, where trees have fallen over and they have this big cavity underneath, that's where they're gonna den. But something that surprises people is particularly in central Maine, we have a lot of ground nests. And so this is an example, if you look really closely, you can see the contours of a bear right here. Do you see that? That's a black bear. And this is what the nest typically looks like. Um, so a female will go into a thicket of spruce and fir, so your Christmas tree type um, forested areas. And those spruce and fir are gonna capture the snow throughout the winter. But if you look closely, you can see some of the snow still goes down through the vegetation and lands on, on the bear's back. And if you remember, I talked about that dense woolly undercoat. That's really important to keeping them warm in those, those cold temperatures. And so she's gonna actually live out the winter um, in, this, in this location. Um, it provides her an easy opportunity to escape if something disturbs her. Um, but it also provides her with cover and protection for raising those cubs. Although bears sometimes den in trees in Maine, it's not really a very common um, den structure for us. And the most common den structure that we'll see in trees are typically in the base of a cedar, where you have a hollowed out tree and they're in the bottom. Very rarely do we have to climb a tree to get at a bear in a den. As you move south, where I did my master's work, uh, bears den more commonly in, in hollow trees. So it's gonna move on and talk a little bit about bears diet. So a lot of people think of black bears as carnivores um, and that they eat a diet mostly comprised of meat, but surprisingly their diet is mostly vegetation. And as I mentioned earlier, when bears uh, leave their den in the spring, that's a a time period where they're most food stressed because they've been living off their fat reserves all winter. And so in the springtime, that's when we're gonna see most of our conflicts with black bears because they're, when they emerge from their winter dens, um, they're going to take greater risks to find food sources until um, foods ripen up in the spring. As our berry crops begin to emerge, that's when we see our conflicts subside. So what, is a, what does it look like for bears in the springtime? So when they emerge from uh, their dens, you can often find bears in the tops of trees. And so they're gonna be eating the fresh emerging buds. So this is a couple of bears up in an aspen 
And so they really like aspen buds in the springtime. They're also going to be often found along road edges, eating fresh emerging vegetation. Um, and then you can also see some bear sign in the woods where they're going to tear apart uh, logs or, or um, roll over rocks, looking for insects and larvae to feed on. And then also in the spring, deer fawns and moose calves are most vulnerable to predation. Um, so bears will eat the occasional deer fawn and moose calf. And they'll also forge on any carrion. So any animals that didn't make it through the winter that have died, they'll forge on those uh, uh, carcasses of those animals from the, from the winter losses. As I mentioned, as spring wanes into summer, berries begin to ripen. So bears spend most of their time foraging in, in berry areas. So if you have a raspberry thicket, that's going to be an area that bears may enjoy going to. Um, as well as blueberries and strawberries. Um, and this is a great source of complex carbohydrates for bears that helps them bulk up for the winter. Some berry crops persist into the fall, but nut crops are largely more common in the fall. And uh, this is really an important fall food for bears because it helps them put on those fat reserves they need to survive a winter of fasting in the den. And so we have a couple of different common um, species that bears will forge on. This is again a beech tree that a bear's climbed up of up. And then here's some beech nuts here in the in the bottom screen. We also have acorns and beaked hazelnut. This slide kind of lists a, a variety of the um, different foods, the most common foods that bears eat here in Maine. So again, we have a lot of the hard mass, the beech nut, beech hazel nuts are being some of the, the top um, nut mass that they eat. And then we have a lot of different soft mass. So people think of blueberries, raspberries, blackberries, and strawberries, but then you have some other soft mass that maybe people don't think of that often, pin cherry and choke cherry, mountain ash, and even apple trees and apples in the fall. Um, and then of course, there's the insect larvae that I talked about in the spring and different fresh emerging uh, vegetation like aspen buds, sedges, clover, and as I mentioned, um, carrion or deer fawns and moose calves. So I'm gonna switch gears a bit and talk about management, but if you want, I could probably take a few quick questions if there are any. There are a bunch, Jennifer. Um, let's see. Uh, um, here's one. I noticed on the habitat map of the USA that black bears are in Alaska. Are they ever attacked by polar bears as a food source? Oh, that's a pretty good question. I think um, black bears are, are, and I don't have a lot of experience, so I'm, I'm going to just rely on what I know, but that would be an area where they're going to have a much more diversity of predators. There's also grizzly bears, or and sometimes people think grizzly bears and brown bears are two different species, but actually they're the same species. So you have grizzly bears or brown bears also in Alaska, and that's an area where they're likely going to have conflicts with these bears, and particularly young bears are going to be more vulnerable to that kind of mortality. Um, I think you're going to address this, but there are a couple of questions. Have you seen a black bear before? Have you seen a baby black bear? Yes, I've seen both of those. So, and that's going to actually get into the next few slides, like you mentioned. Um, but that's one of the fun parts of my job is that um, we do a lot of monitoring of black bears. So we go to the dens of female black bears every winter to document how many cubs they give birth to. And so every winter, I usually see at least a couple of cubs. And um, a couple of related questions. Uh, one is, are black bears hard to find in the United States? And are black bears going to be extinct? Yep, black bear populations are very secure in the US. There are parts of the country where um, they have had protections, but most of those populations have now recovered. So Louisiana is a good example. They had um, an uh, black bears were listed as threatened in Louisiana, but they've been removed from the list. So bear populations are secure throughout North America. Um, and what was the other part of the question? 
will they go extinct? And are they hard to find? Those were the two. Okay. So here in Maine, they're hard to find because if anybody spent time in Maine woods, it's pretty dense. And black bears are, and the title of my presentation is The Ghost of the Woods. So they're very quiet. And so they move across the landscape in a way that they're not very detected. Uh, so people don't often see black bears. Um, however, if you spend a lot of time in northern Maine, particularly in the springtime, at dawn or dusk, you'll often find them foraging on road edges on that fresh emerging vegetation. So that's the time of year where you might see them. But then I also showed you some slides of bear sign. And so if you don't see bears, if you spend some time in the woods, you can keep an eye out for their sign to know that they might be in the area. All right, do you wanna move on or you want one more? Sure, I'll take one more. Okay, do the male bears den with the female and cubs? Very good question, no they do not. So the only time that males interact with the females is when they breed in the spring or when they're with their mother as cubs or yearlings. Otherwise, uh, males and females uh, don't tolerate each other. Um, and so a female is going to den by herself and she'll either den with her cubs if she's produced cubs or den with her yearlings if she has cubs from the previous year. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, so as I mentioned, I'm gonna talk a little bit about our bear management program in Maine. Um, it involves a couple of different topic areas. So we spent a lot of time monitoring the health of our bear population, which I'll spend a number of slides discussing. And I'm not gonna go really much into harvest management, but we have a very abundant bear population that can sustain annual harvest. So part of my job is to manage um, our harvest and determine whether or not we can sustain the level of harvest we're currently having. So bear hunting in Maine is highly regulated. We set the seasons and bag limits to maintain our bear population at um, desirable levels. Um, another area that I'm gonna talk a little bit about is conflict management. And that's something that affects a lot of people um, because we have a lot of bears in Maine. People sometimes have bears show up in their backyards and cause problems. And so I'll talk a little bit about that. And then, Finally, I just want to wrap up that even though population monitoring harvest and conflict management are kind of the three facets of bear management here in Maine, we incorporate this into a planning effort. And so I'll talk a little bit about that planning effort and the public input that's involved in that. So this gets at one of the questions that we got earlier. And so Maine is, we're really fortunate to have one of the longest running and most comprehensive bear research programs in the United States. Starting in 1975 uh, in Northern Maine, we started monitoring um, black bears by capturing uh, bears in um, live traps in the spring months and marking each bear with ear tags and then giving every female bear that we captured a radio collar. And over the last 47 years, we've captured over 4,000 different black bears. And on an annual basis, we monitor between 50 and 100 radio collared black bears. Uh, these bears provide us with information about the status of the population. And so these bears don't volunteer, but we kind of recruit them into our study. Um, and by equipping them with a radio collar, we can learn about how many um, of our adult females are producing cubs each year, how many cubs are they giving birth to, how many of their cubs are survive, surviving each year. And that's important because as I alluded to, we also have harvest and harvest is a major source of mortality for black bears since they have few natural predators and don't succumb to disease. And so by managing the harvest, we know how many bears are removed from the population every year. And by monitoring these radio collared bears, we know how many bears are recruited or added to the population every year. And so we're trying to keep our population stable at current levels. And so by monitoring these radio collar bears, we can learn a lot about whether or not we're meeting that objective. So by equipping these female bears with radio collars, we go to their winter dens each winter. And here's a couple of our biologists pulling out an adult female with her radio collar. Um, and we're going to replace that radio collar so we can track her next year to our winter den. 
And then we're going to observe whether or not she produced cubs, if she's productive age, or if she had cubs the previous year, whether they survived. We also take measurements of the female and her offspring so that we can get overall health of the bears. So as I mentioned, we've been monitoring black bears in Maine on three study areas. Um, here, this map kind of shows them one in northern Maine, we call it the Spectacle Pond Study Area. We had one in Stacyville from 1982 until 2004, and we closed that in 2004 to open up a study area in Down East Maine um, that's been open since 2004. And then we have one in Central Maine, we call it the Bradford Study Area, which is just west northwest of Bangor. Um, and that's been open since 1982. And so again, we that's where we've been monitoring our bears. And by monitoring these bears, we've shown that since 1975, our bears are really healthy and they can sustain the level of harvest that is occurring. And it's keeping our bear population at levels um, where we'd like to see them main, maintain over time. So why do we have one of the largest bear populations in the Eastern United States? Well, anybody that's spent any time in northern Maine or in most of the state knows that we're largely forested. We don't have a lot of human development pressures, so it provides a lot of habitat for black bears. Um, and it really provides kind of a unique opportunity so our bears can actually live and forage um, without interacting with people that much. Due to having a largely undeveloped forested habitat, our bear population is one of the largest here in the lower 48 and particularly here in the eastern US. But over time, our bear population has been slowly expanding into southern and coastal areas where we have more people. And so, as I mentioned, um, since bears are long lived and have very few predators, our bear population growth is managed primarily through regulated hunting. And Maine, we have a fall hunting season where between 10,000 to 12,000 hunters go to the woods looking to harvest a bear and about 3,000 to 4,000 bears are harvested annually. So that um, is roughly between 25 and 30% of our hunters are successful in harvesting a bear in the fall. In 2017, the department completed a big game management plan that involved extensive public involvement to guide the management of Maine's four big game species, black bear, turkey, deer, and moose. And the overall goal of the bear management plan in Maine is to maintain a healthy bear population while mi minimizing growth in areas of higher human density. And to do that, we're hoping to maintain our bear population at current levels. Despite having a really large bear population, we have relatively few bear complaints compared to other Eastern states where bears live in closer proximity to people. So although we respond to about 500 bear complaints on average each year, the numbers fluctuate in response to the abundance of bear and nut crops. So not only do bear and nut crops determine when bears enter their den um, or when, or the overall health and fitness of our younger bears, um, it also influences the number of bear complaints we have. So when natural foods are low, we have more bear complaints, which is understandable. They're gonna take greater risks when they can't find natural foods. So they're gonna wander out uh, looking for, for food in backyards. Most of our bear complaints really involve um, bears visiting bird feeders or getting into garbage. And most of these can be in, avoided um, by just really removing or securing your attractant in the spring. So if you remember, we talked a little bit about when bears are most active. They leave their den in April um, and start looking for, for food in the spring. And then they remain out until October or November. Uh, and so that's the time of year between April and November that we recommend that people pay close attention to whether where they're storing their garbage and whether or not they have bird feeders outside. And bears that get a food reward. So again, remember they're taking a risk to come into a yard to forage on bird seed or pet foods that are left outside. Every time that they get a food reward, they're more likely to take that risk. 
As we talked about earlier, bears have a very diverse diet that is mostly vegetation. And in the spring when they emerge, that's a period when they're the most food stressed because they've been living off their fat reserves. And so that's when we see most of our bear com conflicts occurring. And then they again subside when our berry crops ripen. Typically we start to receive our, our bear complaints as early as April. And based on the slide, you can see the number of bear complaints kind of peak in May, June, and July. And then as the berry and nut crops emerge, the number of bear complaints reduce. So really um, the bulk of our bear complaints where bears are foraging and close to backyards occurs in the spring and early summer. So given the timing and the number of bear conflicts, a good question that comes up is, should we be moving black bears that are co causing conflicts? Capturing moving bears is easier than alternate, um, alternating human behavior. It's really hard for people to bring their, keep their garbage stored inside and bring it to the curb the morning of trash pickup. And they're more likely to take it out the night before because their mornings are busy and hectic. But by leaving their, net, their garbage out on the curb in the morning, or, or overnight, bears are more likely to get into that garbage and cause a problem. So it's much easier um, to, to really um, capture moo bears and alter human behavior. And it's often viewed capturing and moving bears as an acceptable and humane practice by the public. It is also a very good tool to immediately alleviate any issue. So allowing you know an individual time to initiate practices that will remove or secure and attract it so it allows somebody to find a time when they can um, bring or a location where they can safely move their livestock or store their livestock feed and so that's why we might sometimes consider moving a black bear however given all those reasons of why we should move a black bear because it's easier than altering human behavior um, and it alleviates a conflict until we can secure those things that are attracting a bear. We actually often don't advocate for moving bears. And the reason we don't advocate for doing that um, is it often doesn't really address, provide a long-term solution until the attractants are secured. And so, um, what often happens is it's more of a short term solution. If you move a black bear, they often return to the problem area. They cause problems elsewhere, but they're also at greater risk of being um, killed. Either they're going to be found in somebody else's backyard causing problems, they're going to get struck by vehicles, or they're going to have reduced body condition. And so, so those are the reasons why um, we don't consider moving bears, except for in those rare circumstances where we need to do that to alleviate a safety concern. So now that we've talked a little bit about bear ecology and conflicts, how do you know when a bear behavior is a safety concern? And so it was really hard. We don't have uh, grizzly bears here in Maine, but it was really hard for me to find an image of an aggressive black bear to put in the slide presentation, but I just wanted these kind of show some normal versus more aggressive bear behavior. So in this one, the bear is up on its hind legs, but you can see it looks almost has a look of curiosity, right? Its ears are forward. It's trying to get a better look. Um, so that's kind of a view of maybe less aggressive or a bear, more of a curiosity uh, behavior. Another thing you might see is if you get too close to a bear, say you have a you round a corner and you're hiking and you there's a bear on the on the trail. Um, if you've gotten too close to it, the bear's usually going to vocalize. They might pop their jaws, telling you you're a little too close. Those are not signs of aggression. That's them telling you, "Hey, back up. You're too close." Um, bears that you need to be more concerned about in terms of their behavior are bears that are quiet. They're not popping their jaws, they're not making any vocalizations, um, but not only are they quiet, but they're, they're stalking you, they're approaching you with their ears back. Um, that's a bear that you're gonna be concerned about. But I wanna tell you, this bear is a bear that you rarely see. Um, 
this is considered a predatory bear where they're viewing you as a potential food source and that very rarely occurs. Most bears, when they encounter people, run the other way. I have this video and I'm just going to look at the time. I'm going to, I'm going to see if I can play it real quick. I'm going to skip ahead because I just wanted to show you this is what you're normally going to see if you encounter a bear. It'll play. So there's a bear in the woods. I'm going to skip ahead for a little bit just for time. Maybe go right there. Whoops. Can you hear the audio? What do you They're talking about the babies that are in the woods. So this, this, oh, I hit pause, hold on. I'm gonna skip ahead a little bit. Just in the interest of time. So she does, she stays out on the trail for a long time, really doesn't care that much about the people being there. It's coming back because the cubs are in the woods. So I wanted to show you that just because that's, you know, people have a lot of concern about bears and what to do if they encounter a bear. And because they're a large animal, they invoke a lot of natural fear. And I wanted to show that that's typically what's gonna occur. That was in the Smoky Mountains uh, National Park. And there's a lot of bears down there and a lot of visitors. And so there's a lot of videos on encounters with black bears. But there's also a video of showing what not to do where, but I didn't include that one on here just because of interest of time, but um, there's an, a nice video of people in a, in a parking lot where a female with cubs come out and a visitor approaches the female to try to shoo her away from the road. And because her cubs are there as he approaches, she actually pounces and does a little bluff charge 
and then he backs off and she takes the cubs across the road. So that's an example of some a bear just saying you're too close. So um, also in the interest, because people have a lot of concern about being around bears, we've developed um, the black bear managers across North America. So not only here in Maine, but every state has a bear biologist that has bears. And so we developed this, these messaging um, so that wherever you are, you're getting consistent messaging about what to do if you encounter a black bear. And this um, brochure is actually available on our website. And it just talks about the different ways you might encounter a bear and what you can do to avoid a negative encounter with a black bear. So one thing that I think comes up a lot is should I be concerned when I go hiking or walking now that I know more about bears and I know there are a lot of bears in Maine, can I, is it safe for me to go walk the dog? Is it safe for me to go hiking? And generally I would say, yes, it is. Continue to do the activities that you enjoy doing. Um, now you're a little more knowledgeable about bears. Um, and But it, we also find people are much more comfortable doing things if they know or they have some guidance on what to do in the rare event that they encounter a black bear. And so what we know by looking at these encounters that are negative that occur between people and bears when hiking is that some of the things um, when these encounters become negative and somebody's injured and sometimes even killed by a black bear is that it occurs when they're hiking in small groups and when they don't stay together. Um, so what we always encourage people to do is if you're gonna go hiking, try to stay in larger parties keep your kids close. Kids often run out ahead of you, keep them close um, and stay together if you encounter a bear. One other thing that's interesting is we all love, I do myself, enjoy walking our dogs and I'm gonna walk my dog every day. Um, but if you're going hiking, we always encourage you to keep your dog at home or keep them on a leash. When um, bears have attacked people, it often involves dogs off leash. And so what happens is a dog smells a bear, they run into the woods to try to get closer and investigate what that smell is. And then the bear gets scared by that dog and they turn and they chase that dog back and the dog goes back to the owner. And so that's why we say it's better if you're hiking to keep your dogs at home or on a leash. Um, but I just want to reiterate here in Maine, we've only had a handful of bear attacks in over 40 years and most of those have involved bear hunters and not uh, people recreating. So the, the, even though I'm providing you with this information, just remember it's extremely rare that these things occur. Another thing that makes people comfortable is if you're hiking, carry a walking state, stick with you because in the rare event that you had a negative encounter with a black bear, um, by having a walking stick, you have a way to defend yourself if that bear started to become aggressive. So what do you do if you encounter a bear? Um, so the big thing to do is don't approach a bear. I should have really showed that video of that, that individual in that parking lot. Um, don't turn and run. A bear, as, as you learned earlier, are not clumsy. They can move at very fast speeds. You will never outrun a black bear. But if you have something close at hand, like a vehicle or, or a house, you may be able to back away or quickly get to that um safety area before bear can reach you but the best thing to do is slowly back away and stay together um, if you're approached by a black bear again most of the time it's curiosity they're trying to figure out what you are and if you wave your arms and up in the air and let them see that you're big and something to be scared of that often enough to deter bear um, but if a bear continues to approach, you want to stay, stand your ground, um, just not back down. And then if a bear makes contact with you, what we know about black bear attacks is that if you fight back, you're more likely to survive a black bear attack than if you play dead. So we have these brochures available on our website. But again, I just want to point out that it's very extremely rare that those things are going to occur. And then I threw in some camping do's, mostly do's and not don'ts. Um, so if you're camping in areas, um, like you can spend the day in Baxter Park and camp. Baxter Park has a lot of this kind of information available to people that are gonna camp in those areas. But here's a good example of what you can do 
to eliminate food odors around your campsite so you don't attract the bear to your campsite. So cook 100 yards from your tent, keep your cooking area clean after you're done. Don't sleep in your, in your clothes that you're cooking in. Don't stu store your food in your tent, store it in a vehicle or in a lockbox. Another thing to keep in, in mind is keep your windows closed. Bears can actually, there's a crack in your window, they can actually put their claws in there and pull down your window or break your window and get into a vehicle. And so store it in a vehicle with the windows closed. And uh, with that, I had questions and I did, I think have at the back, back end here, if people wanted a virtual bear den visit. Jennifer, did you wanna do questions first or the virtual den visit? I can, I'll just walk you through a few quick slides and they'll be quick. So each winter, our radio collar black bears are located either with GPS collars where we get information from satellites telling us where the bear den is, or we have our pilots, our warden pilots up in the air locating from aircraft the location of the den site. And then we go in by snowmobile. So we spend a lot of time in the winter on snowmobile going into remote areas of the state looking for these bears and their dens. Here's an example of our telemetry equipment. So um, black bears have a radio collar that emits a signal. It's not audible to the human ear or even to the bear's ear, but with this piece of equipment, we can actually pick up these little beeps and it's very directional. This antenna will tell, this is the front. So the bear is actually behind her. She's listening, but the direction of that bear is behind her. So now that she's in the woods, um, they're getting closer to the den. We often have a crew of two to three people, um, just in case as we approach the den, the female decides we're too close and she bails out. Each of us have um, darting equipment with us so that we can dart the bear um, as she leaves the den. You saw this picture earlier. Here's an example of a brush pile den. So once we locate the den with our telemetry equipment, the task is finding where she is and taking her out of the den. So we uh, chemically immobilize the bear using the same types of drugs that your vet uses on your, on your dog or cat. And so we sedate that or immobilize that bear with, with drug that's in a, on a syringe on a long pole called a syringe pole. And it usually entails again, looking for where that bear is. So we have flashlights and we're looking in through the brush pile, trying to locate where the bear is. And then once we find the hole, we actually deliver the drug and then we wait for the drug to take effect. And then we climb into the den to take the bear out. And so here's an example of take, removing the adult female from the den. We can see our ear tags and our radio collar. And then, once she's out of the den, we, we reach in and grab the cubs. So there's one of us passing back a cub to somebody else. These are often really, really tight holes that we're going into. And then the major thing that we do is we replace the radio collar on that female bear so that we can continue to follow her throughout her life. And as I mentioned, we're interested in her condition and the health of her cubs and yearlings. And so we weigh or measure the bears. We also look at how many cubs she produced, um, whether they're males and females. And then we even mark the, ear uh, the cubs with ear tags so that when we come back next year, we can see if they survived. And so that I believe is it. Oh, and that was just a video I had that I'm not gonna go into now, but I can take questions with the remaining time we have. Great, thanks so much, Jennifer. Um, there are lots of questions. Um, goodness, to go back here. Um, do black bears live in other countries like Asia? Yeah, the Eurasian black bear. So yes. Um, is it true that black bears gain lean muscle mass during hibernation due to nitrogen cycling, recycling? Nuh-uh. 
Yeah, uh, that is a good question. Always somebody asks me something that stumps me, but I do believe it is true and I'd have to look into it to, to say for sure. Uh, let's see, why do black bears have sharp teeth if, if they mostly eat berries? That's another good question. So it allows them, one, to protect themselves, right? So there's aggression that occurs between, particularly among male bears when they're, so male bears will often fight in the, in the um, spring and early summer for access to females, but also that it also is used for tearing meat because they will forge on carrion and, um, and young, young animals in the springtime. So they do, even though they're, they, they have the dentition that allows them to be omnivores and take advantage of whatever food resources available to them. Uh, here's someone from Southern Vermont who wonders if this, if it's the same sort of bear population in Vermont as so, me. Yep, so in terms of, so I'm not quite sure what that means, but I'm, I'm gonna try to interpret that. So we, it's the same type of bear, it's a black bear and their populations are similar in terms of their population status, healthy bear populations um, that behave much like the bears do here in Maine and their management is similar to how we manage them here in Maine. Uh, here's one, do black bears swim? Yes, they can swim. And, not, um, and they often will visit um, little ponds or wet holes in the, in the summer when it's really hot just to cool off. Um, and, but they're not an animal that spends a lot of time in water, but they are capable of swimming. Uh, is it legal in Maine to have black bears as pets? No, it's not. Unless you are a facility that has a permit for um, like a zoo or a rehab facility, but not as pets. So they're more for educational purposes and they go through a permitting process. Um, let's see, here's one. So it's best to wait for them to move along. I see people who will talk loudly to the bear and clap to get them moving is why I ask. So they're asking if they should make loud noises to keep a bear away? Yes, I think so. Wait yep. to have them move along or clap loudly. Yeah, so I, I think it depends on the situation. So if the bear, like in that video where they're far off, um, and there wasn't really, you're, you're far enough away and the bear's kind of doing its natural activities, I think you can wait. But if, a, if you encounter a bear and, you, and you're a little concerned that you got a little close, you can clap or make loud, loud noises or you see one and you, you want them to kind of run from the area, that's very effective. So I think of an example, um, you look out in your backyard and there's a bear in your backyard and it's coming in for your bird feeder or your garbage, stay in your house and make some loud noises, clapping your hands and yelling is a good way to deter a bear. Um, or if you are hiking and you come around the trail um, and you see a bear and you're a little closer than you want and it looks like it's checking you out, then I would make some loud noises. Great. Um, in the video situation, here's someone wondering so the bear and, and her cubs walked out of sight. Would those hikers, should those hikers have kept walking in the same direction on the trail or turned around or waited, waited some time? And if so, how much time? Um, and also, what do you do if you do happen to encounter one of the rare aggressive bears in the woods? I think you covered that with us. Um, but in terms of whether to follow the bear and cubs or go the other direction or wait a certain amount of time. Yeah, we recommend that you don't follow them um, because you might get closer next time. So part of the reason that that encounter was probably the way it occurred was they weren't in close proximity. You could see when they, they kind of zoomed out of that video how far back they were. And so that bear felt safe. Um, and comfortable enough to wait for her cubs. And they were that bear being in the Smokies is probably a little more tolerant of people um, because it's used to encountering uh, people on those trails. Um, but in general, I'd say, you know, either give it some time for the bear to move on or to turn around and go back um, would be the two things that I, but I would not follow. 
How about bear bells? Will the bear bell noise deter bears from coming close to you? So I know that that's recommended in other parts of the country where there's other um, more aggressive or not more aggressive, but you have black bears and you have grizzly bears um, and you have more concerns about, and a lot of hiking activity. But what the biggest recommendation is bear spray. And then of course I mentioned the walking stick is also another option, but the nice, you know, the bear bells don't make a lot of noise. The big thing is when you're, when you're hiking in, and walking in areas, if you're talking, carrying on a conversation, what you're trying to avoid is surprising a bear that you actually get too close. So in that example of that video, if um, they had come out just as that bear was coming out of the woods and the bear didn't see them, they rounded a corner and the bear was there. What you wanna do is make some noise so the bear hears you before you kind of round that corner. And so just talking, carrying on conversations, uh, making some noise while you're hiking is effective. Um, I'm not sure that there's a lot of science to support bear bells, but it doesn't hurt. Two more questions, Jennifer, and then we'll wrap up. Um, one that just came in. So you, if for someone uh, hiking alone, say, you suggested having a walking stick. Do you also recommend the bear spray? Um, do you recommend carrying bear spray in general? Yep. So here in the Northeast, it's not something that's a common recommendation. If you spend any time in the Western US, wherever you go, they're gonna tell you, and that's largely because there's grizzlies, um, bears out there where there's more negative encounters between grizzlies and people uh, than there are black bears and just puts people at greater risk. I would say if you're concerned, you can get bear spray, but also know how to safely use bear spray. There's lots of videos available online to show you how to safely use it. Um, but in Maine, I don't personally carry it. Um, but it's but if it's a, an area that gives people comfort, then I recommend they, ca they carry bear spray and know how to effectively use bear spray if they're gonna carry it. And lastly, there've been a bunch of questions about your personal experience with bears. Have you ever have you ever handled a bear? Have you, um, yeah, so maybe just share your, your favorite experience with a bear or, or how close you've gotten to a bear, something like that, and we can wrap up. Yep, so as you can see from some of those slides, so over the course of my career, I've captured black bears using um, foot snares that are, are widely used in black bear research to capture bears. Um, and then I've visited bears in their dens um, and had to mobilize a female who's awake when you're when you approach the den, as well as get to handle these cute cuddly cubs. Um, I have seen bears in my activities, you know, foraging on the side of the road, um, traveling up roads a number of times, just because I spend time in the outdoors, and so I've seen them, but always from a distance, never even as close as that video. Um, but often close enough that I can take photographs of them. Um, but I've never had a negative encounter with a black bear. Um, and so a good, ex and probably the, I think anybody, it's that first experience that's the most memorable. And so I was a, a just recently graduated from the University of Maine with a degree in wildlife management. I was my first trapping season on the bear crew here in Maine. And um, Randy Cross was the bear field project leader. And he had young kids and he was picking them up at day or dropping them off in daycare. So I was checking the trap line myself for the first time after we set traps. And he was describing to me what it was gonna be like if I found a bear in a trap when I went round the corner. And um, we had most of them you could drive up to and see it from the vehicle or just have to take a few steps away from a vehicle or an ATV. But we had a couple that you had to walk in to the site where we had the trap. And so I had one that was on a uh, old woods road that had grown in with spruce and fir. So there's young spruce and fir, but there was a kind of a, like a game trail that you could walk along. And that one was an unusual one where we had a big barrel um, as as a, a way to kind of show it was it was a trick 
for some of our bears that were used to kind of the other ways that we set our traps. So we didn't typically use this. So we had a barrel with bait in the back and the trap in front of it. And so a, a, it was a big um, metal drum. And so it's kind of looks black and the inside's black. So when you're walking down this game trail, this, so imagine this um, grown in road with spruce and fir and just a little game trail that you're kind of walking along. And I was looking up ahead and I could see I get this barrel up against a tree and I'm squinting and trying to say, is that the black I'm seeing? Is that a bear or is that actually the barrel? And it was, there was actually a bear there. And so like that first experience of seeing a bear, you know, gets your adrenaline, the, just really going through your body. Um, and then, and then the excitement that you were actually successful at what you were trying to do is capture a bear so that we could equip it with a radio collar and monitor it. So that one stands out as a memory. Thank you for sharing that and for all the information you shared with us. Thank you, thank you. And thanks to everybody who attended. Um, I know I'm certainly gonna check out that brochure on your website and carry that with me. So thanks for that tip as well. And there's also a brochure on that website about what to do to remove attractants from your backyard so that you hopefully don't create a situation where a bear gets used to that food reward in your backyard. And this is a time of year to start thinking about that. Great. Thank you, thank you. Have a great afternoon, everybody. Thank you, everyone.